Recently, I was at a lecture in which um, someone was giving a talk, and she was reading from these, a large uh, 11 by 17 piece of paper and kept turning the pages. And you could see nothing on the pages as she was turning them. And, and finally, but yet she was clearly reading. And so at the end, it, so it read as a kind of performance. And at the end, I was trying to figure out what was happening. And the, the text that she was reading from had been copied so far, har, high up on the page that um, you couldn't see it as the viewer, but yet what you encountered were just these large blank pieces of paper. And so I'm sorry that I'm not going to give that kind of performance tonight, but it uh, did make me wonder if uh, museums collect performances and undocumented ones that, at that. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the Portland Art Museum as a collecting institution has asked me to speak about some uh, object in their permanent collection. And there are two major um, collections of note within the museum. This one, which is the Rasmussen collection of Northwest Coast Art. And then the second, and smaller but uh, equally important, is the Greenberg collection. So nowhere else in the museum does the notion of, or the act of collecting, stand on display as much as it does in these rooms. Um, we can feel this collection, the market, the desire for the authentic, the emphasis on the ah-historic, a drive for what is commonly seen as a vanishing past. We feel the weight of colonialism, the nature of extraction, a sense of intimacy, and most particularly, one object standing in for a whole. Western artworks are often described within schools, movements, or focus on a, partic a particular master or a set of masters, whereas works such as these are often abstracted from historical time and collective belief so that beliefs so that inv individuals and whole generations are collapsed into a composite figure known as the ethnographic present, which is Sally Price's terminology. Further, we are aware within our li own lifetime, the presentation, our tools of interpretation or meaning making is in continual flux. Labels change, for instance, names change, Spellings vary. So here, this is a label that was just added about six months ago, in which the artist of this piece, which I will be talking about, um, uh, uh, was named, and uh, <coughs> therefore connecting this work to a whole other body of works. So my primary area of expertise is in modern and contemporary art. And for me, that means looking at space and how we navigate and move around an object, <clears throat> how a work, ooh, pardon me, how a work engages um, with mechanisms of display, ob object photography, the document. <clears throat> and largely, this is derived from a Eurocentric and um, a, approach to art history. So uh, just to make that clear that that's where I'm coming from. So for this talk, I sought to discuss an object within Pam's permanent collection that had been on view for several decades so that I could trace the changes in exhibition display strategies. So in a sense, taking this object and seeing how it's look, how we can see the look back at the museum, and how it, in, you know, um, changes th throughout its own um, time here, or how our observation of it is altered. <clears throat> so I began working with the museum's archive, which is next door in the. Uh, Crumpacker Library, which is an amazing place. It's a um, pub uh, open to the public, and there they have some 50,000 art books that are for reference use only, along with an archive. And um, the archive includes the entire PCVA, the Portland Center for Visual Art Archive, um, which I 
learned through this process. Um, and so, and I, you know, I, I want to mention that I feel lucky to live in a time where we can physically touch archives and look through files and look at photographs and listen to audio tapes or films. And um, I don't know that that will always be so, but uh, at this moment, I encourage you to take advantage of it. <clears throat> So, and for me, the experience of working in an archive is a sort of way of foreshortening history and that the sense of time completely um, falls away and uh, 200 years feel, feels very proximate. Um, and there's another aspect of working within an archive, which is when you, you feel a sense of humanity when you uh, are requesting a file and that that file is delivered to you and you have no idea what will be inside of it. And that process of discovery and path of meaning making and how it alters your path is really interesting. And the PAM archive, like many archives, is organized on the folder level. So you're requesting things um, like correspondence from this year, you know, very broad. Um, uh, topics, and it's very interesting when the wrong file is provided to you because and how that takes you down another path. Um, and so what I sought to do was to go through the archive and look at the museum's images of this object um, throughout the course of its display. And what I found was that Pam doesn't keep records of um, of its per objects within its permanent collection as they're re-exhibited. So uh, essentially, a work is shown, and it receives a initial photograph as part of its um, acquisition or uh, registrar records, collection records, and, um, and then maybe additional images occur through publi um, publicity and media, but those images aren't necessarily um, collected together. So, uh, and that's not true of special exhibitions which are heavily documented and then on occasion an individual curator of a um, collection will re um, coordinate the re-photographing of an object. So finding images of this object throughout time was challenging. Um, and then, um, then there was a, a, a particular file that opened things up for me, so that was great. Um, so my initial impression was that the Rasmussen collection sort of fell into the laps of the Portland Art Museum. And what I found was that um, Robert Tyler Davis, the director at the, um, um, at the time of the acquisition of this work, had um, been extensively writing um, for several years, um, many antique dealers and galleries and what were then considered sort of curio shops, um, seeking uh, what he was calling Native American art. And there was such an urgency that telegrams began to, or, um, to be sent and the, um, a sort of like rush to obtain these works. So through uh, Davis's engagement with Mr. Stendhal, um, an anti antique dealer and gallerist, he was able to begin acquiring um, Northwest Coast artworks, which would eventually lead to the 1947-1948 acquisition um, of the Rasmussen collection. Um, uh, which in part was exhibited at the Young Museum prior to its transfer to um, Pam. So at the time that uh, Robert Tyler Davis was sending all of this correspondence, there were no funds for the <laughs> acquisition of these works. So he, he needed to uh, acquire those funds and um, which he did, um, so they formed the Indian Art Collect Collecting um, Committee, and uh, in part, school children um, gave pennies 
um, to um, the museum so that the work could be purchased. And that notion, for me, or that, that the aspect of the pennies is, is interesting to me in the, in the sort of similarity of um, uh, the use of copper, which um, it, I'm abstracting, but we'll come back to. Um, so one of the things that the um, Portland Art Museum has done for a long time is uh, they keep scrapbooks, like for decades, they've kept scrapbooks. And they're huge. They're maybe, like each scrapbook is probably four inches thick because they just glue all of these newspaper articles in there, anything about the Portland Art Museum. And so they're like these big, crunchy objects. And <clears throat> um, so I was able to trace uh, some of the initial um, uh, mechanisms of display and the reactions um, of the, and to the um, acquisition of this um, work through those scrapbooks. And, um, and I, I guess there's one other thing that I, I wanted to mention, which is I feel like the Portland Art Museum was strongly positioning itself as an avant-garde collecting institution in the late 40s by acquiring this work. It was one of the largest um, uh, Northwest Coast collections. Um, it created an enormous amount of media for the museum, both national and later international. And it is still one of the most important collections of, of um, this type of work nationally. So um, I think that's in part why we see the fever. And you can trace back to the um, late 1880s, 1890s, to some early um, sort of large exhibitions um, in San Francisco, in Chicago, in New York, and, um, and also in um, Vancouver to a kind of generation of interest. Um, and then, and with the early um, uh, um, advent of anthropology, but I'll get there later. But back to the scrapbook. So um, let me get it. I want to show you. So I, I have this big pile because I had to raise this up. <laughs> it was a little too low for me. Um, so. These are some large ones. And there was a certain point where the librarian didn't want me to photocopy, or she photocopied for herself, so, or for me. So um, I didn't get to make these copies, but here, here's a few. And then, um, I'm looking for, there's one in particular that's really great. Anyhow, um, so bear with me as I read through some of these because the comments I've, I've uh, laid out in a particular order and to give you a sense of my thinking here. But uh, the exhibit will mark the departure from cust custom in displaying works of Indians. As far as can be learned, this will be the first known presentation of such material as art. Exhibiting products of Indian crafts as art in the art museum is stealing a march on the anthropologists who have previously dominated the study of Aboriginal culture. We are ready to agree that any past boredom with Indian collections has been due to the lack of judgment and imagination on, those, on the part of those arranging the displays. For weeks, carpenters and painters have been, work, have been at work upstairs in the upstairs Hirsch wing of the museum, preparing the background for the first major exhibit of Indian works solely of, as art. Both the large and central gallery and the corridor of the Hirsch wing have been redesigned to create an appropriate setting for thousands of diverse objects. 
Under the su supervision of Ms. Kimball, artist consultant, walls have, been take have taken on an earthly tone, as well as cabinet bases and the shelves and partitions constructed to house the collection. Light uh, highlighting the earthly color are touches of brownish red and blue, which pick up some of the colors in rare headdresses and other Indian objects. Among or upon entering the building, visitors to the museum find themselves in the shadow of, for, of a forest fir, of, of a forest of fir, cedar, and hemlock. Against the curtain of green foliage, four great house posts stand forth in scarlet and black. Smaller objects are displayed on platforms covering, covered with river sand, further symbolizing the waterside villages in which Indians lived. Foreground space is taken with, huge, with a huge food dish, more than 15 feet long, carved in the shape of a man. It was used to feed 100 persons at a time during the great potlatch festivals. The collection is interesting because it opens a window on a culture indigenous to this coast. It offers rich material, too, for modern designers and artists who work to work over and adapt as themes of current usage. We ought not to ignore this heritage which belongs to this region, even if the race that created it is now displaced in power and prestige. Already there are indications the exhibition will get national attention. The April 15th issue of Art Digest will carry a feature article about it, and the magazine's cover will, be, will depict a panel of some choice objects. The picture book of the collection will be prepared for fall publication by Stanford University Press. And then Art Digest writes, the time has come to remove the anthropo anthropological dust and appreciate that this country has an art uniquely its own. So there, again, over and over you see this kind of um, language around, this is an American artwork at this time of the emergence of, you know, a sort of high modernism and, um, and a emphasis on um, the Northwest region. Um, so then uh, the, the museum, the entire time it's uh, working to acquire funds is also pairing all of its writing with there will be this publication around the exhibition. And that's an important part of, of the exhibition itself. So um, the, uh, Robert Tyler Davis writes in the foreword of the um, uh, exhibition monograph, um, uh, let's see, which is called Native Art of the Pacific Northwest from the Rasmussen Collection of the Portland Art Museum. And it looks like this. Um, <clears throat> it says, the art world has, during the first half of the 20th century, concerned itself with searching for new fields of interest and new sources of inspiration. And then he goes on to write, perhaps the art world is one world and everywhere sensitive to the same pressures and enthusiasm and its leadership European. Americans did not investigate the, potential Americans did not investigate the potentialities of their own continent. And so this sort of issue around the use of it and the, um, and the forwarding of this being um, like this new thing that then can contribute to um, the dialogue is, is a bit troubling. So um, then of the objects, some of the comments are most striking is a huge ceremonial food dish, 15 feet long and carved from a single tree trunk. And then an immense ceremon ceremonial serving dish more than 12 feet long. And then it says, the collection includes many things from a very ornately carved food dish, which novices, uh, which to a novice look like a canoe. And then from the Portland Art Museum's 1966 publication on the collection, which is this one, which is, which is good. Um, which is, it's, it's edited by, Erna Gunther, who uh, is an was an anthropologist at the University of Washington. Um, uh, she, she says, there is a dish from the Quacutal of Alert Bay which shares traits of the north and south. It is over nine feet long. 
So the um, caption here doesn't indicate the length. And this thing, I mean, part of what is so striking, obviously striking, <laughs> too, is the scale of this object and that kind of grappling with um, understanding is, um, is interesting to me. Um, so not only was there a dramatic um, surge of press, the museum wrote the city to see if the director could be, become um, like the citizen of the week or something like that, which he did. Oh, he, he was, they were, he became the citizen of the week. Um, I have the correspondence in here um, uh, for staging the exhibition. So I made these books with some um, materials from um, images and correspondence and things like that that you guys can look at while I'm talking. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, So the fact that the initial um, curation of these works was staged in the context of a landscape or, um, of wilderness and paired with a f um, formal design aspects of um, including the wall colors which accented the items of collection is something to note as we move forward into the future. Um, and. Um, so before, so I'm going to go on to talk about what I realized quickly was that in order to look at the issues around display, I needed to understand a lot more about this work. And um, I frankly did not, re decoding the, the caption was hard for me. Um, and so let me just say that this is a quack walkie walk, zuni qua feast dish or potlatch dish carved by Charlie James. So um, quack walkie walk is the tribe and also sometimes referred to as quack hudel. Um, and uh, zuni qua is the woman. And um, the reason I was told that the Portland Art Museum calls this a feast dish rather than a potlatch dish, as it is cited in many of these books, um, including um, the both museum publications, is because it also functioned um, in, in non-ceremonial feasts. And I think that that removal of the, of the word potlatch is, is actually a little troubling because that to me is the, um, the sort of essential and critical um, component of um, understanding the, the very um, uh, nature of this work and why there are you know, these, these various bowls within the, the work and, well, to me, it is the work. So, um, <clears throat> so the Kwak Kwaki Wak are located in um, Vancouver Island, or uh, in, Br in British Columbia, and are sometimes referred to as the South Kwak Yudal. Um, there are about 5,500 Kwakwakiwak living in Canada today. And um, uh, generally, the Kwakwakiwak are made up of um, approximately 13 to 20 different governing bands of people. Um, and uh, so the word Kwakutl is a more general term that um, I will sometimes use, um, but Kwak Wak is, is a, a sort of more refined, and is a, a sort of westernizing term. Um, so I had no idea that the potlatch was such a um, loaded topic. 
It, um, there is so much scholarship on the potlatch. Um, and it ranges from the beginnings of anthropology to considerations of the sign and signify to um, issues around um, economic theory and, um, uh, and I, it's extensive. Um, so the potlatch occurs um, during the winter ceremonies. And it's a Chinook jargon term, um, uh, which is some, um, sometimes, and, it, and it's specific to the Northwest Coast. Um, and so the term is sometimes translated as to give away or a gift or to feed or to consume. <clears throat> um, but generally, there's this um, notion of reciprocity. So um, a potlatch would occur during um, what a ceremony would forge a sort of an inextricable network of rights, um, both legal and, and economic services. So, for, um, and the Kwakwakiwak were known for hosting extravagant potlucks. And um, so multiple tribes would gather together. There would be a large exchange and of gifts and a general redistribution of wealth based on your stature. So um, uh, at that, um, and it, it is a kind of contract or bond, or um, sometimes you may, maybe would think of it as a kind of notary. And if I give you a gift, you must therefore be able to exchange, return a gift of a sort of equal value back um, to me. So that sort of um, necessitated rec reciprocity was really um, a strong part of this. So um, it's a, um, not only was social rank and inheritance recognized and affirmed and passed on in the potlatch ceremony, but um, a potlatch could be held for a wedding, a funeral, a birth, a land transfer, an execution of an artwork, um, recognizing a new chief. And um, it's quite possible that a potlatch um, would have been held for the creation of this work, which is, I think, a very nice kind of cyclical aspect to this. Um, so during a potlatch, there would be elaborate ceremonies involving dances and songs and raising of totems. And this is this little sort of vignette related to the potlatch in which these masks would be worn. So there's this kind of um, contextualization that's happening here. Um, that uh, and I think one of those is the mask that's worn at the end of the ceremony. Um, so, actually, um, anyway, um, so I'm 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 curious if it's possible that the, through the increased abstraction of capitalism in the United States and Europe that we don't in turn see this pairing of scholarship um, on the potlatch and reciprocity that would contribute to the rise of interest in uh, Northwest Coast art in the 40s. Um, that's my argument. Um, so I want to kind of back up for a second and give you a context of the general um, state of Vancouver Island and the um, at leading up to the time of the making of this object and then um, going forward. So, you know, we have 1778, Captain James Cook uh, lands on Vancouver Island in the 1840s. We have the Hudson Bay Company coming in and establishing its headquarters there. And then um, 
between 1830 and 1880, 75% uh, of the Kwakwakiwak population um, has died due to, mostly to disease caused through colonialism. Um, in 1876, the Canadian government begins to establish the Indian Act, which then in 1844 becomes a ban on the potlatch. So if you held a potlatch or you participated in a dance related to the potlatch ceremony, you would be imprisoned. So this was carved in around 1900. So the potlatch was illegal in Canada at the time that this was carved. And that law was revoked in 1951, which is just nutty. And um, so I don't know if this is an appropriate comparison, but I, I, there was this man that I kept coming across that was really interesting. His name's Dan Cramner. And he, uh, in 1921, held what the largest recorded potlatch. And 45 people were arrested. So what would happen when people were arrested is people would sell their tribal, like their ceremonial objects in order to make bail. So although objects were sold, they were sold in this, in this way that was not favorable or it was out of, you know, a kind of like one bad option versus another. Um, so you have all of that kind of atmosphere happening, like massive amounts of people within your community dying. You, and the need for the potlatch, which reaffirms the, the individuals within your community's stature. You need to have a new chief, and how do you do that? You do that through the potlatch, but it's illegal. All of those things combining are adding to a really intense dynamic. And then you add that in 1897 to 1902, Franz Boas and George Hunt decide to, what do they call it? A, I haven't written it here. Um, it's, it's something like the Jesuit expedition, not Jessup expedition. Um, they go to Vancouver Island and they just start. They, Franz Boas documents more extensively the Kwakutl people than, I mean, it, the Kwakutl people are written about more than, potentially more than any other tribal group, largely due to Franz Boas. The level of extensive documentation and collecting. And George Hunt, because he spoke, um, the uh, Kwakwakiwak language, um, which is, uh, I haven't written, I'm sorry, um, uh, was able to kind of serve as this um, intermediary. And they literally gained um, the right through the Canadian government to, um, take things lives. The level of invasive um, detriment collecting um, that they conducted, but also the extensive amount of writing um, on, on these people um, had um, huge, like the ramifications are something that we're still experiencing. And Franz Boas is one of the, those people whose name comes up in all of the scholarship on this work and is still an, a very influential anthropologist and um, came up with ideas around cultural relativism and this non-hierarchical um, sort of progressive view of history so there, and that we would do what we've done here. We would group within a, a context and see within a cultural lens. So there are some good and bad things about Franz Boas, but he was also the curator of the American Museum of National, of National History, Natural History in New York, and um, later went on to um, Columbia. 
so the Zunikwa, coming back here, um, is a woman in which is considered the wild woman of the woods. And she both eats children and is the giver of great wealth. She lives in the woods and makes this sort of hooing sound, which is this very beautiful quality about this object, which these lips are, th are making a sound, this object's making a sound, um, of the sound of, of her in the, um, moving through, the wind through the cedars is the sound that she's making. That is really her sound. Um, and I can tell you the long story about the part about eating children and the giving of wealth later if you're interested. But um, one of the things that's um, important about, oh, and I guess I should say the sort of um, West, Western version of her is um, the Sasquatch or Bigfoot. And so some people believe that they have seen the Zunikwa woman. Some people believe that she has um, moved farther into the woods now due to industrialization. Um, and she is a very powerful figure that is often um, associated with the potlatch bowl for the Kwak Kwak Kwak. And um, so when, when, a, when you're seated for a feast at the potlatch, and the, everything is based on rank. And so the, this portion of this object, this um, mask here, lifts off. And this is a bowl in which the chief eats out of. And then the next highest ranking chief, so you notice that it's a woman, but she doesn't have any breasts. So her breasts are the bulls that are right now, they're inside there. But they're not always, I mean, you'll see in the images of this object elsewhere, you know, they kind of dance around her at different times. But so, you know, her, her right breast is the second highest ranking chief, left breast, um, third, and then you, and then it goes on down from there. And then generally people who, um, are just, um, are of lesser rank, like, um, would then ladle from the general um, core of her body and eat um, into their bowls and eat from there. And so you eat with one hand. And this is all really interesting when you start to look at the first published image of this book, of this object in this book, which is this man performing the act of dishing out, this one man, and he's got his hand on there, on the object. I mean, there's, it, there, there's a kind of just general fiction of this man in complete solitude I mean, it, that it, I think is very um, telling of how the, it, the object is completely ab ab abstracted from its history and just becomes a sort of stage or like prop rather um, for our own narrative. And then, then you have the classic kind of 50s design of like t making a formalist kind of graphic layout where the, the head of, of her is then placed here. And so the, the, these large eyebrows, these caved in eyes, the really red lips that are formed in the shape of an O, sometimes um, are very, are features that are often associated with the Zuniqua. And sometimes you'll see this object with hair and bushy eyebrows. But it's my understanding, due to the scale of this, that it would most likely have belonged to a chief.
that it would be a potlatch bowl that belonged to a chief because the, of the general scale and a very, very wealthy chief. So at this point, we know that the, the object's making a sound, that there's a kind of procession of, of stature based on the object. Um, oh, and the position. I've always felt that the orientation of this object is strange here. Um, I don't know why, but it, it's always felt odd to me to enter with the head over here. Um, and uh, the orientation is actually an important thing. Um, so if the feet are pointed towards the door, um, let's see here, um, then, the tr then the chief is capable of reciprocating, the, chief, the, um, the guest is capable of reciprocating the feast. If the reciprocation is, is not present, then the, then the object is reoriented. Okay, so, um, and also sometimes you'll see that these potlatch dishes are really brown inside of the bowls, and that's because of the grease, the oil, the, sometimes they're oil um, bowls that f dried fish and that kind of thing get dipped into. This one doesn't really have that, which, so much, which is interesting to me, um, because I um, have wondered, based on the time period in which this was carved and what was going on um, in Fort Rupert and Alert Bay, what what the end use of this object might have been. I, I it seems that it was probably used, but I just don't know how extensively. So that's totally outside of my expertise, but. Um, so, uh, um, as I mentioned, th um, this, re this work was mo uh, recently attributed to the artist Charlie James, um, whose um, cer ceremonial name is Yakulas. Um, and his sort of common name is Duma. Um, but he's often referred to in uh, scholarship as Charlie James. So he was born about uh, 1867 in Port Townsend, and he carved this work in his mid 30s. Um, and he, um, he died in his uh, early 70s. So um, it was carved um, from red cedar and painted with commercial paint, uh, which is, were introduced by, um, in essence, the Hudson Bay Company. Um, and uh, that's not to say that he did not use um, more traditional paint, or uh, it's not necessarily more traditional, but um, pig natural pigment-based paints previously, but um, this work is painted with um, commercial paints. Um, so at the time, as I mentioned, pot, um, of the carving, the potlatches were outlawed, and, um, th and there was an increased need in um, creating new positions within um, the, the tribal house. Um, through the potlatch, and in 1890, there were 10 um, Kwakwakiwak people. So the, the, um, at the same time, uh, you see that there is a, a dramatic increase in um, production of works um, in Fort Rupert and, um, the, or, and around this area. Um, and in part, that's due to um, the uh, um, increase in um, collecting by individuals such as Franz Boas and George Hunt. Um, so 
James was, um, was known for developing the Fort Rupert alert base style, which um, uh, is seen through his most famous work, um, which are the Thunderbird house posts in Stanley Park. And um, those were commissioned um, by Edward Curtis for his film, The Land of the Headhunters. Um, and also pictured on Curtis's movie, movie poster. So, um, so he, um, Charlie James clearly worked in multiple markets um, for both uh, not native and non-native markets. Um, and I think it becomes interesting as he ages how he starts to produce more and more model, uh, model totems um, for the tourist industry, which sort of erupted around 1915 due to changes in transportation. And normally, within a, an art museum context, you would not want to talk about um, objects made for the tourist trade, but that's an area that's shifting in scholarship, and I don't think that we should shy away from that, um, because ultimately, he needed to make a living. <laughs> so, um, uh, additionally, in the deeply controversial and controversial and um, altering uh, exhibition um, that occurred in 1984 at MoMA called the Primitivism Show, um, his uh, Charlie James's work was um, exhibited. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the, that exhibition in a minute. Um, so because a lot of Charlie James's work were not attributed, it's very hard to trace back through um, in current scholarship. But Ronald Hawker, um, who wrote a wonderful essay on Charlie James's work, is publishing a um, book on him, his work in, um, it will come out in April 2015. And so what will happen most likely is what has happened here, and there will be a sort of retracing of our understanding of um, Northwest Coast Kwakwakiwak artworks, and um, as his um, general project starts to be seen and connected to him. Um, so he, uh, he was also a um, teacher of carving and um, forwarded many important other, um, many important carvers' careers, including Elizabeth Neal, um, who, uh, was a really interesting early female carver. And I have a photo of her. Um, he was also good friends with Hugo Martin, who's a, or, and related to Hugo Martin, who is a um, totem carver and restores totems. Um, and so, not only was he deeply prolific, but he also created a sort of lineage of carving um, and um, included women in that process. So coming back to the general um, drive of this um, investigation, um, was looking at photographs and the various modes of display of this object. Now we have a sort of general understanding of what it is we're looking at. Um, so um, photographs have played a large part in, in transforming the contextualization of most objects. Um, the images operate between the document of art and fiction, performative, and invoke the young. So, um, I noticed while looking through the correspondence of the years surrounding the exhibition of the Northwest Coast Indian Artworks that an, an, there were numerous requests for documentation from, um, um, to the director requesting that images be able to be published. And repeatedly, the museum would say, you can kind of track 
where they are with their um, document their uh, like when they began to photograph the object in color because for like maybe 10 years or so they're saying we don't have you should look at you know this this um, catalog which is the original book in published in 49 we don't have any color photographs and in in um, publishing houses are saying we'll pay for the um, for the museum to photograph the object and then in 1950 um, a, the life magazine photographer Arnold Newman um, photographed this work along with uh, many other works that were acquired in the Rasmussen collection um, along with a few other objects that were acquired around uh, 1949 in this very dramatic um, image on, um, that was part of a story on um, what do museums buy. So sort of looking at the nature of collecting at that moment. Finding out that that image was in Time, <laughs> or in Life magazine, was a complete journey. <laughs> and it's those subtle things that you don't realize um, how connections are made. There was no, I, that photograph exists within the um, Portland Art Museum collection, but it was never in a file um, with the, a copy of the magazine. I, I, the whole process was originally learned, I finally learned that it was in Life magazine through reading the scrapbook pages. So I'm, I'm, the scrapbooks are really pretty great. Um, so um, that, what was, oh, so um, Arnold Newman documented his process in um, constructing that image and tightly choreographed the placement of the objects um, into something that is mo more of a, um, it's, it's definitely a photograph. It would not work well in terms of the hanging if you were in, in there in person. There's like the appropriate, you know, the formal qualities of the image um, are tightly controlled. This is the image. Um, and so, of course, you have um, the director hanging on to um, Charlie James's work and that forming the central sort of catch of the image. Um, and um, then again, in 1960, so looking at, um, further into other instances of um, the use of the photography of this image, um, in a review of the um, catalog, the, the 1966 catalog, um, we see that Audrey Hawthorne says, such catalogs will allow for comparative studies of style and technique and uh, of a scope far beyond which can be made by an indivi by individual museum visits, and so that uh, that function of of how an image is constructed and allows for a sort of comparative um, analysis is something important as because even today these objects are so um, uh, they're. I, I don't, you know, for instance, I'll speak for myself, there are very, I have seen very few, two probably, um, potlatch dishes in my life. You know, so to kind of compare these objects to one another, it becomes important to look at the photograph. But um, that sort of associative relationship between objects becomes um, more pronounced when, um, uh, in, in 1948, uh, MoMA stages the Primitivism Show, and on the exhibition catalog cover, 
um, which functions as a sort of catalog resume for the exhibition. Um, they, there's Picasso, a Picasso image, and then a coquetal mask. And Clifford James, who is a terrific scholar, um, writes about the viewpoint of in which the image is shot, which creates this notion of affinity. And the general sense of affinity, which is a kinship term, um, is the very one of the very premises of the exhibition, which completely ex extracts um, any sort of uh, um, uh, the well. Essentially, the works are used to visually create comparisons to substantiate modern European and American modernist works, and not. But they don't. But they aren't necessarily directly inspired by the work in which they're paired, and that is where the problem lies. Um, so. Um, you know, the show becomes criticized for the, not only the decontextualization of, of the, the works, um, but also re, reasserting colonial assumptions. Um, so uh, to, conc to conclude, I thought I could look at, and we could talk about this object as it is presented today, and, um, and then the future. So um, it's different to be, it's, for me, the experience of being in this gallery is a little different at night than it is during the day, because during the day, I'm so aware of how dark it is in here. And even though it doesn't seem so now, those rooms over there appear very dark during the day. And that is, is I think, a coming out of a curatorial strategy called inherent vice, where objects have this, like, they are um, susceptible to light and interior um, uh, disintegration. And so lighting conditions are staged around this, this um, quality of these kinds of objects. But that sort of perception of a greater mortality of these works versus other works in the museum is something that um, troubles me. And as I mentioned, this object is painted with commercial paint. And I would love to see it in a different kind of light. And something that allowed us to really um, for it to, to be um, experienced in, this, in a similar way that we do other objects within the museum. But that is, it's a very sticky area to say that because of, of the mass amount of scholarship and to kind of, um, in terms of how these works should be shown and to the, what an ethnographic museum does and what does it mean, and the, extracting these from that context and placing them within an art museum. So I think we still have some of the relic of the ethnographic museum through the, um, the presumably cedar plinth that this is staged on. <clears throat> and I don't think that there's anywhere else in the museum, or particularly not in any of the modern and contemporary wing where we see this kind of drawing down of the material into the exhibition, the mode of display. And I think it's also, you know, at this place now where we clearly can't touch or engage with the object, and yet um, the, our, the, pri the early um, exhibition of this was so much about this kind of tactility and physical engagement. And that, in, through um, talking about that I was going to do, or t in talking with the staff here at the museum, everybody had a story about how this object had been treated or used or, you know, um, and there's many 
many odd rumors um, and, and truths of, how, of the life of this object since it's arrived. But, um, so one of the ways in which other institutions have dealt with this in, inherent bias um, issue is um, they have created graduated lighting. So you move from a highly lit area into a slightly less so and slightly less so or a strong amount of rotation of objects. So that, um, because there's this trouble where you want to both be a very good steward and protect these objects, and at the same time, ultimately, they are to be viewed. Um, so how you balance that. Um, again, I talked about the orientation, and there is um, one image here with, which um, comes from when it, the work was first displayed, where it's in a large space where you can walk around the object. And because of, of this kind of laying back and this incredible suspension, it would be so nice to experience the sculptural quality of this work and to fully be able to move around it. Um, uh, I think that because of limited space in this gallery, it's probably seated here. Um, I think that I've always felt like there has been this kind of push upward and that this is the passageway to the um, uh, contemporary Northwest art um, galleries on the top, on the top floor. And so what it means to pass by this object and um, on the way up in this kind of effort to solidify this as um, relational. And um, uh, and then, um, let's see, um, but, Um, so I guess the last part, the last couple things that I want to say is that um, the sort of extra surprise of this process for me was that the museum is about to rearrange this gallery. <laughs> and um, they will also publish a book. So this context that I've given you and this kind of focus on display is a sort of last minute kind of approach for you to like really take in how are things being handled at this moment and what do we see and how are, how is our, uh, you know, how much is about, um, how much do we take in as in, and interpret as, um, like what is the level of information and context that's given, and how is that versus, because that typically is a um, more ethnographic mode of display, and yet these objects are still so far out of um, the, I think, a general, at least for me, uh, outside of the realm of my understanding. And so to kind of bring in this kind of multi vocal voice is, was, is part of um, the conception and is also very much part of the way in which um, these um, works are now being displayed. And I think that's excellent. But also, there is a trend in, in museology where um, technology is being added. And um, they say that children, when they see placards, they try to swipe them because they think it's a pad they can swipe. <laughs> and I think as we sort of hustle towards technology in order to kind of keep up with the times, there's a kind of gap or delay in that and that we don't, as soon as that effort is made, um, we no longer need it. We, most of us carry an iPhone in our, uh, on us and we have the potential to, or if we want, we can, look something up or do so later. And this kind of like 
cluttering with with a, a, a guided um, um, bit of dialogue, I think can um, can be ch um, can actually be to the detriment of um, an exhibition because notions change. How we think about this today is totally different than how we thought about it in 1948. How we go about displaying it, and 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 it's and also it like the very notions of abstraction and the and what is art are all upset by at this stage. And so to kind of solidify things into a concrete form, we wouldn't be able, to, you know, things like this, this kind of eventual evolution of an object, um, we're constantly trying to keep up. And I like the ability for things to be very, just the kind of like pure taking in of something without all of the, the extras. Um, I understand that they allow for greater access and information, but um, I think that you know it's through um, interpersonal engagements, conversations, and um, resources such as are in the library that we can find those and individuals. You know, um, so. Um, I you know I don't know that we need to put technology on display next to the thing always. Thanks you guys. <laughs>